It was the kind of a call that police officers go on every night all around the world, and one of the saddest tasks they're asked to do. A call reporting the natural passing of a member of the community. In a small community like that of Fort Ann, New York, it's not unusual for the responding officers to know the deceased, or at least family members who are present. On the fateful night of July 9, 2017, that familiarity may well have caused the officers involved to realize that something was not right about the situation they had walked into. Join us as we look into the death of Leona Twiss and the suspicious circumstances of her passing. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the family of Leona Twiss, as well as the multitudes of people in the community who knew and loved her. It was a warm but breezy Sunday night in upstate New York when deputies were dispatched to the home of Leona Twiss. The 95-year-old woman had been reported as dead by her grandson, Kevin Gagne, and his wife, Melissa. Leona had been suffering from Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and the Gagnes had been living with her for the past year to provide her with around-the-clock care. Leona and her husband, Walter Stubby Twiss, had lived at the house at 9 Twiss Road for almost their entire lives, raising two children of their own, a son, Gordon Twiss, and a daughter, Janice Gagne. Gordon, a well-known barber in the community, lived just a short way down the road from his parents on Twiss Road, named, of course, for the family. Gordon's son, David, also lived in the town and was now a retired corrections officer. Janice had married into the Gagne family and had later moved to Florida, passing away at the age of 61. Her son Kevin had been partly raised by Leona and Walter during his youth. He had returned from Florida with Melissa to help take care of his grandparents when Walter became unable to drive. Walter passed away in November of 2016, and his widow fell deeper into the tragic grip of Alzheimer's and dementia. As the Gagnés took care of Leona, the family began searching for a skilled nursing home facility where she could be placed that would accept Medicaid. Those nursing home spots, however, are hard to find, and the Twist family had spent better than a year frustrated in their attempts. After arriving at the scene, the deputies were taken to Leona's room and were able to verify that she had passed away. As is normal procedure in these cases, they began asking the Gagnés some standard questions to establish a timeline and a manner of death. Melissa began with her explanation of the passing, explaining that Leona had been at the lake that afternoon with family members. When she had been brought home later, the elderly lady went on to bed, but got up again, something that she regularly did numerous times each night. So, she was at the lake, the lake all day, you said? Yeah, eating with them? Son. And she came home right after her son left. She went in there to get ready for bed. What time was this, roughly? Nine o'clock. Around nine? Roughly, okay. That she went to bed. Okay. We sat here for about 20 minutes, and then we went and laid down and was watching TV. We were just about to sleep, and I heard, we both heard this loud thump. And I thought maybe she was going to the bathroom or something, so I didn't think nothing of it. And then my dog started barking and raising cane. So I told Kevin to get up and make sure Graham was okay. He walked in there and he turned the light on and she had blood coming out of her face. We don't know if she fell off the bed, hit it on the headboard, what she did, but we heard the thump and when he walked in there, she was bleeding. He came back and told me. I got on the phone and tried to call her grandson and her son because they told us to notify them. So I called them and they came over and called you. The husband, Kevin, begins his part of the story to the deputies. So when you, when you walked in, she was... I didn't even know, man. <laughs> how long between hearing the thump and seeing not, her? Not, not, not even just about... Few minutes, just, just a few minutes. I came minutes. out and went to the bathroom, come back out and said, I said to myself, you took on him. Was she conscious or was she? Well, I don't know. She, like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't want to wake her up. I just opened the door up and I looked at her and she looked like she was sleeping and I pulled the door back, closed the gate back, and I just went to bed. 
And then a few minutes later, come back out here. He went in and turned the light on just to double check on her. She was already bleeding. He came in and got me. I went and looked at her. I told her the back of her head was bleeding. And of course, her nose and everything was bleeding. And I said, she must have fell out of bed or hit it on that headboard, I said, because, and got herself back up. Because she's fallen out of bed several times. She always falls out of bed. And she's fell against that door several times. She has a very bad she's, tendency of falling. She'll be 96 in a month and a half from now or whatever. You know what I mean? In a person of Leona's advanced age and frailty, falls are both commonplace and extremely dangerous for them. Broken bones, hematomas, and even more serious injuries from simple falls are commonplace with the very elderly. The couple continues their story. You just kind of open the door to see if she's... I opened the door to see if she's... I was like, okay, she's good. You know back what I mean? Back, I went back to bed and I come back out. And kept out. running through his mind so he came back in here. And, and looked at her and I said... Let me go check on her, you know, and which I usually do anyways. I walked in there and seen the blood and I was like, oh my fucking Because she's falling out of bed before and I've gotten up to go to the bathroom and she'd be hollering, I can't get up. Something isn't sounding right, even though the story is not just plausible but commonplace. Deputy Dansko questions them again, asking them to retell the story in an attempt to get a cohesive timeline. Kevin's obvious inebriation could mean that he's either just mixing things up in a drunken stupor or that he's trying his best to stick to a prepared story. Melissa's part of the story doesn't seem to line up. I'm just okay, so I'm just trying to get a time frame of when you first checked her to when you second checked her. The oh, first time he checked her was I'm probably not, about 10 to 11. I don't, I don't look at and at 11 is when he turned the light on and saw her bleeding. I don't look at clocks. Dude. That's when he came in and got me. But she fell initially around... About 10 till. Who knows? Or, or probably before that, about a quarter till. Who knows? Okay, so it was like a 10... I didn't see the clock or anything, so... Who okay. knows? Until I mean, he got up and head came head. in and told me that she was bleeding. That's when we don't pay I looked at the clock. Time, really. You know what I mean? Wait, if you're sleeping, yeah. We don't pay attention to the fucking time. Kevin then begins to talk about how Leona would get up and down at all hours of the night for a variety of reasons. Caretakers of people suffering from Alzheimer's often cite this as one of the most trying and difficult parts of their everyday life. The person in their care often becomes disassociated with time, not knowing what time of the day it is, and they get up and continue to live through imagined scenarios or specific times in their lives. It wears hard on the caregivers as they have to interrupt their own rest cycles, not only to care for the people, but also to protect them from harming themselves. The acts are random, and the person suffering from dementia can become angry or violent in response, oftentimes not even recognizing their caregivers, even if they've spent their lifetime with them. Had Leona had one of these moments, fallen, and hit her head, and then gotten back into bed under her own power, it certainly seemed unlikely considering the extent of the injury and her own weakness. Still, the deputies had to consider those possibilities. They allowed the Gagnés to continue explaining themselves. I went in, I just peeked at her and saw her face bleeding. I saw her ears bleeding and I looked and I saw that there was blood on the pillow. So I didn't move her, but I looked at the back and saw the back of her head bleeding. And I'm going to say because... She does fall about all the fucking time. Either she banged her head on the stand or a dresser or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I can't say what. But I am going to say she banged her head on something and, and got back in bed. I have no clue. Because she does it all the freaking time. Deputy Dansko then asks a very important question. Did they check to see if Leona was still alive before they called in emergency services? And you checked her pulse? Uh, I went in. I didn't see her chest. I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't touch until, her. I didn't do shit. I didn't, I didn't want to mess with her. He called her grandson and her son. I didn't do nothing. When she they said came she was gone, I went down and got my cousin. 
I looked in there just like this, and that was it. I went out and got my cousin. I said, she's gone. What's your guys' relation to me? Okay. Did you say? At this point, Deputy Dansko turns and goes outside in response to a call on his radio, leaving the other deputy to finish up getting the information for the paperwork. Dansko walks outside to his patrol car and begins speaking to another emergency responder before turning off his camera. Leona's body was brought in as usual in these cases, and the Gagnés were left to take care of the business of alerting the other family members and to grieve. The suspicions were there, though, and the Washington County Sheriff's Department immediately requested an autopsy be performed on Leona's body. A forensic team from the state's Bureau of Investigations went to work and quickly determined that the injury to the back of Leona's head was not fatal, that there had been no major blood loss from it, and that she had not succumbed to any of the numerous natural causes of death for a woman of her age. By the following Wednesday, July the 12th, the Sheriff's Department had a definitive statement on how Leona had died, and it was a homicide, one that would have only been identified through an autopsy, one that left few, if any, visible marks. Leona had been strangled to death using a soft towel. The Sheriff immediately put out warrants for the arrest of Kevin and Melissa Gagné, Deputies and investigators moved out to Twist Road in an effort to serve the warrants. The Gagnés weren't there, though, so while some stayed at Leona's house, another group stopped at Gordon Twist's home. They spoke with Gordon and his wife about the Gagnés. The officers received an earful of opinions and information when they got there. The body camera footage is from Deputy Jeff Latour. What follows is a fine example of community police work in a rural area. The deputies keep everything casual and establish their relationships with those involved. They allow the people to talk as freely as they want as they await the news that the Gagnés have returned home. I just want to relax. Who are you for this? Okay, I've been taking pictures. Okay. I've been taking pictures on Facebook. She did plan on having a... Pick them up. Is they did it. They did it. I know. The driveway. Do they have any other car? What, what car do they have? It's Brett Porter's car. I'm gonna. I, I, I'm stealing now because I want them. Mom did not deserve this. She didn't deserve this. Just a simple statement from a deputy who is familiar with the family gets more information quickly. What What makes you think this guy? I just know it from what I saw. From what I've seen him do to her at times. No 95 year old lady should have had it gone through. He came here to help out because mom did need 24 hour care. And she was calling here all the time. We were taking her as much as we could because she was afraid to be up there. She said he was always mean. And I just, I saw, I saw the whole scene that night. I saw the slit in the back of the head. I saw what he's done to his wife, dragging her. The wife he's with now? Yeah. Okay. And he's a fucking red dick from fucking Florida, and I just, he's had other, I shouldn't be stealing my guts, but I Listen, have to because I want it, justice, I want your, justice. Is that your mom? That was your mom? It's my mother-in-law. Okay. And then she asks a pointed question about how they thought Leona had died. At this point, there had been no press conference or announcement of murder to the public much less how it had happened. We've got, we've got the results back. Was it strangulation and then a well, blood to the head? The, I'm just the, asking. The biggest, the biggest thing that we need to accomplish right now is talk to them without at putting out their I know, that's why I have not results, said a word. So. I have not, I've been very quiet. I, I feel it was strangulation with a towel. That bit of knowledge, especially about the towel, would become very important in the future. The deputies got the call that they had been waiting for, the Gagnés had returned home and had been stopped before turning in their driveway by the officers waiting there. Deputy Latour jumps in his vehicle and tears down the road with the other deputies and inspectors close behind. 
As he arrives, it becomes apparent that the sheriff's department had a definite plan in place to handle the situation. In the 11 months that the Gagnés had been living in Fort Anne, deputies had already been dispatched to their home twice on domestic disturbance calls. So, coupled with the apparent homicide, they had to assume that at least Kevin could be a violent threat. There was no knowledge of whether he could be armed or not. But with Melissa in the car, she could go from co-conspirator to hostage very quickly. Also, Kevin was known to be a raging alcoholic. With it being close to 8 p.m., the chances were good that he would already be drunk and very unpredictable. Kevin also had a police record back in Florida with at least one violent incident on it. As officials moved into their position and Deputy Latour begins speaking, Melissa is quietly moved from the vehicle and back to a waiting sheriff's vehicle. Not only does this protect her and open further access to Kevin from another angle, but it also prevents the two from working together to corroborate their stories. Well, we're just going to explain to him what's going on right now and things like that. So, yeah. No weapons are in the car. No, no. Nope. Kevin and I have a good. Kevin, right? Nope. Kevin. Yeah, we, fist pump, flu season. We have a good oh, yeah, report. Is too. I don't need to get sick. Hi, how are you? Hi. My name's Dave Moe. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, we, we, we have a warrant for the house, so you're not allowed to go in the house. Okay. Okay? okay. A deputy, who was a childhood friend of Kevin's, then approaches the car and keeps the conversation friendly and casual. Hey, Hello, Ray. Hi, you look familiar. Look at my name down. Fucking 40-ass school taught you better than Oh, me. my <laughs> God! John like a, Winchell. We still got to get down behind Morrissey's. And find those fucking shoes we lost in mud that day. What do you got in the cooler? You remember that? No oh weapon, my right? god, you mean down in the fucking. Yeah. Oh, fucking shit. Alright, look at we got it. We got to talk to you. Okay, I'm okay. so sorry. About you. Okay, um, so if you would jump right in the car, right here with this officer, this is Deputy Latour, and go down um, and talk to the guys and just tell them what's going on. Okay? Just. Well, I don't know. Right. Yeah, but you have to be a pretty well lit. Yeah. Good. Very good. Very good. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Neither of us were gray back then. Well, are you trying to say I am now? <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on. Uh -oh. there's, a, there's a secret to it. That door lock does All right. not go straight up. You can't bring your beer. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> I know it's not fruit juice in there. No, no. He then talks him out of the car and eventually into a sheriff's vehicle to be taken to the station to answer a few questions. You're a big fella. You look at your mom. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to hear that fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, I, I grew up with this guy right here, man. Right, I got man. the keys in. I'm going to move the car into the driveway for you. You can't fit in there, man. I can fit in there. Are you fucking serious? I got skinny guys. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right, so good. Hey, it's been a long time. And I'll be, down to, I'll be down there to talk to you, too. Where, where are we going? You're going down to our station. Go with this guy right back here. Right here into this white car. What the fuck am I waiting for? What's that? She's talking she's right to... She's going right out. Oh, she's right here. She's right oh, 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 oh. <laughs> she's in the air-conditioned car. See where you ride. <laughs> so you get a ride with the other side. That's pretty good, too. <laughs> you got... Uh, this pump, flu season. Any chance of violence was negated without a single gun being drawn. A textbook perfect example of community policing done right. Both Melissa and Kevin were brought in for questioning and officially arrested and charged for their involvement in the murder of Leona Twiss. Washington County Sheriff Jeff Murray held a press conference immediately afterwards discussing the case. Uh, initially, uh, sheriff's officers were called to the scene of what was reported as a natural death at the residence. Uh, due to the alertness of the deputies on scene and the investigators that were subsequently called to the scene, uh, they found it uh, possibly suspicious and, re and requested an autopsy. As a result of the autopsy, uh, the findings were that uh, Mrs. Twist died uh, as a result of strangulation. 
uh, once we got that information, the investigation began into the two suspects that were arrested. Sheriff Murray continued in response to questions from the press in attendance. You know, it's safe to say that these two individuals were uh, charged with the care of, of the victim. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a sad case when the two people that are charged with the care of the victim end up uh, causing her death. Kevin Gagne was charged with second-degree murder, one count of hindering prosecution, and one count of tampering with physical evidence. If convicted, mandatory sentencing in the state of New York would result in a term of 25 years to life in prison. He was arraigned and held without bail. Melissa was charged with concealing evidence in the case. Her arraignment bail was set at $30,000 in cash or a $60,000 bail bond. She was unable to make bail. As time passed and the trial loomed, both Melissa and Kevin were separately offered plea deals. Melissa agreed to hers in exchange for a reduction in her sentence. She turned on Kevin and said he had been abusive for years, including an incident where he had grabbed her by the hair and pulled her down a flight of stairs, and that she was afraid of him. Her covering up for the murder came from fear, she said. On the night of the murder, she said Kevin came out of Leona's bedroom crying and said, it's done, and then told her to get rid of the towel. Melissa would later take police to a remote area in West Fort Anne where they were able to retrieve the murder weapon. Kevin Gagne also took the plea deal and provided a deposition to prosecutors before coming to court and announcing his guilt. In the deposition, he admitted to killing Leona Twiss by strangulation. At the trial, Kevin's defense attorney said that it was a mercy killing and that Kevin did not want to see his grandmother suffer anymore. Melissa would go on to serve two years in prison for her part in the crime. Kevin was given a term of 15 years to life for his part. Kevin is serving his time at the Medium Security Washington Correctional Facility in Comstock, New York, just a few miles down the road from where the murder occurred. Kevin has appealed his case twice, unsuccessfully. In the most recent appeal, his attorney alleged that he received poor advice from his legal counsel, particularly in providing the deposition before the admission of guilt, which prevented the chance of him later vacating the plea. Beyond that, she said that there was no attempt to assess his mental health issues leading up to the event, the fact that he only possessed a sixth grade education and on that night of the incident he had already drunk two 18 packs of beer and was working on a third when Leona returned home. It was also argued that the continuous care and difficulties had put the Gagnés into a state of extreme emotional disturbance. The potential for extenuating circumstances did not change the outcome, though, and the appeals failed. And this would normally be the end of the case, but there was one serious wrinkle remaining, one that may or may not have been ironed out since then. In their separate depositions, both Melissa and Kevin attempted to implicate Gordon and David Twiss, Leona's son and grandson, in plotting the murder. In Melissa's testimony, she alleged that a couple of months before the murder, David had told them that if things became too difficult, that they could do what they do in prison when they wanted to kill a problem inmate and strangle them with a towel so that it wouldn't leave marks. Melissa then alleged that Gordon had told them it would be nice if she would fall and bang her head. That would be the end of it. David had then allegedly said that he wished things would be over for her. Kevin's deposition included very similar statements. On July the 9th, Leona had been at the lake with the Twist family, and she had become difficult, confused, and angry. It had been a bad day for everyone. Such things aren't unusual in these situations with dementia patients, and they can be very stressful for everyone involved. After dropping Leona off back at home, Melissa alleged that Gordon told the couple, it needs to be done tonight. Arrest warrants were sworn out on both Gordon and David Twiss, and they were brought in for questioning. A deputy at Gordon's arrest said that as soon as they began talking to him, the man looked at his spouse and said, I guess I'll see you in 15 years. Both men were charged with second-degree conspiracy to commit murder and were released on their own recognizance to await trial. They both face sentences of 8 to 25 years in prison if the charges are proved true. As the trial loomed, their defense attorney requested that the cases be dismissed. 
Judge Kelly McKeegan paused the proceedings and two days later dismissed the case on the grounds that the grand jury had not been provided with opinions and hearsay in addition to other evidence and that it did not fulfill the requirement to bring the charges against the two men. Washington County Assistant District Attorney Taylor Fitzsimmons would simply say that it had not been a successful prosecution against the two men. And with that, the case was decided in the eyes of the law, but the murder of Leona Twiss still has uncomfortable ramifications. Caring for someone going through Alzheimer's and dementia is an immense responsibility, and every single day it can be emotionally wrenching, even for trained caregivers. In the case of the Gagnés, it was obvious now that they were overwhelmed by what was going on and the trouble was compounded by their own natures. Had there been a nursing home space for Leona, most likely this entire event would have never happened. If you or a loved one are caring for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, please reach out for assistance. Alzheimer's caregiver support groups are all over the nation. Please give a quick check and you can find one in your area. Also, most communities have some form of a Council on Aging or Elderly Services who can provide you with direct support and advice. You do not have to bear it alone, and there's no shame in seeking help. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.